If you have a Bible or a Bible app, you may want to find Nehemiah chapter 8. Um, all year long we have been talking about story and what makes a great story. And if you've been here with us through this series, you know what makes a great story. You know the four parts of a great story. Maybe chances are you have been analyzing all the stories you've been watching or listening to or reading, thinking, are the four parts there? You know, you're looking at story maybe a little differently. But for the sake of those maybe who are just joining us, let's go over those four parts again really quickly. What is the first part of every great story? A protagonist, right? There needs to be a protagonist, a main character, someone that we could root for, someone that we relate with, someone that we want to win, someone that we're, we're pulling for. There has to be a protagonist, and that protagonist needs to have a, a noble ambition that was so just dynamic and enthusiastic. You guys are awesome. A noble <laughs> ambition. The protagonist, that main character, they need to accomplish, want to accomplish something bigger than themselves, right? They, they have to want to save the village or win the girl or beat the bad guy, right? There has to be some kind of big noble ambition. But on the way to that noble ambition, there needs to be? Conflict. All right. There needs to be some conflict. <laughs> there needs to be some difficulty. Things cannot come easy, for the protagonist. Otherwise, it's a boring story. There needs to be difficulty. So the bad guy needs to be stronger than the good guy. The village needs to be outnumbered. The girl needs to have another boyfriend or be not interested. There's got to be some conflict on the way. And then finally, there needs to be resolution. The guy gets the girl. The village gets saved. The bad guy goes to jail, right? Resolution to the story. And with all these parts of a great story in mind, we've been looking at a really, really great story of a guy who lived about 2,500 years ago. The story is told in the Old Testament. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a great protagonist. He was cupbearer to the most powerful man on the planet, the king of Persia, which means he had a cush job. He got to taste the king's food and drink the king's wine before the king did. And this was Nehemiah's job. But Nehemiah had a noble ambition. As a result of his noble ambition, he left Persia, took a four-mile journey to Jerusalem, where he set about this task of turning piles of rubble that had sat there for 150 years into a wall. We've seen that as Nehemiah has gone about his noble ambition that he encountered incredible conflict. As a matter of fact, the last three weeks we've been looking at the conflict Nehemiah encountered on the way to his noble ambition. He was um, powerful enemies surrounded him, criticizing him, mocking him, threatening him, deceiving him, distracting him, gossiping, him, uh, gossiping about him, even paying off his enemies to betray him. I mean, Nehemiah went through it. He had a very difficult time, but as we ended last week, we saw that the walls got rebuilt in just 52 days, building complete, which really was a miraculous job to do in 52 days, and clearly showed that the blessing of God and the power of God had been active all through this endeavor. Now, we might think that since the walls are finished, the walls are built, that the story is over. Nehemiah's story is over, but that's not true. Um, Nehemiah's story is only half over. That's because Nehemiah's noble ambition was never just to build the walls. Nehemiah always saw the walls as a means to an end. That if he wanted to get to his true noble ambition, Nehemiah had to get the walls built as a stepping stone, a means to an end, so that his true noble ambition could be realized. And that true noble ambition was to see the reestablishment of God's people in God's city for God's glory. Nehemiah's noble ambition was to reestablish a community of worship. And that's what we're going to see in Nehemiah's story today. And all through our study of Nehemiah, we've been continually asking how his story intersects with my story. As he is living a great story, can I also, am I living, can I live a great story as Nehemiah has? And we've seen that there's lots of ways that Nehemiah's story intersects with and relates with our story. And the same is true today. What we're going to see in Nehemiah's story today is, is that if I want to live a really great story I cannot confuse the means with the end. I cannot confuse the means with the end. In other words, when I know what my noble ambition is, I cannot get lost in the things that take me to the noble ambition, thinking that that is somehow the noble ambition. But I need to realize that those are things taking me to where God is trying to take me. So, for instance, if my noble ambition in life right now is to raise godly kids, that means it's really easy to get stuck in just the day-to-day -day activity of life. Driving here, 
cooking this meal, making this decision. Are we going to do this? Aren't we going to do that? Are we going to sign them up for this? Aren't we going to sign them up? How are we going to spend our time? Where are we going to go on our weekends? What are we doing for our vacation? It's so easy to get so lost in all of those details that we forget the noble ambition. The noble ambition is to raise godly kids who grow up to love and follow Jesus. And so how do all of those day-to-day decisions make a difference to get me there? I can't get lost in the mundane. I can't think that this is all just, you know, meaningless. But I need to realize that every decision I'm making is going to take me to a noble ambition. Can't lose sight of that. Or maybe you are dating right now. And you're dating because, not just for the sake of dating, you don't just want to date to date, but you're dating because you have a noble ambition. That noble ambition is to have a godly marriage, right? And so I can't lose sight of that noble ambition in the midst of the means that are going to get me there, that is dating. Otherwise, I'm just going to date to date, and I'm just going to keep dating. I'm never going to stop dating. I'm just going to date, right? But we need to realize that dating is taking me somewhere. It is taking me to the noble ambition of a godly marriage. And so whatever your noble ambition is, we can't lose sight of it in the course of doing the things we have to do to get there. It may be building a God-honoring business or a ministry. It, it may be um, following Jesus, just following Jesus. You know, it's so easy just to lose sight of the noble ambition of becoming more like Christ in the way to becoming more like Christ. I mean, have you ever found yourself maybe in some spiritual discipline? Like maybe you're praying or you're trying to pray or you're reading or trying to read the Bible or you're journaling or you're going to church or you're going to a small group and you just start to wonder, why am I doing this? What does this mean? It just feels like I'm going through the motions. I'm losing my passion for this. If you have been there in your spiritual life, and chances are if you've been following Jesus for any period of time, chances are you've been there. The reason you are probably there is because you have lost sight of the end and you're focusing on the means, right? I am focusing on prayer for the sake of prayer, reading the Bible for the sake of reading the Bible, going to church for the sake of going to church, a small group for the sake of small group, not realizing that those things are very slowly taking me to where I want to be, and that is to be shaped into the image of Christ. If we want to live a really great story, we cannot lose sight of the end in the midst of the means. And Nehemiah never lost sight of this while building the wall. He knew the wall wasn't the end. It was a means. The wall would give the city what it needed so that they can get to where they really wanted to be. It would give them the ability to again become God's people in God's city for God's glory. In short, they would again become a worshiping community. We're going to see this happening in Nehemiah chapter 8. I'd like to read Nehemiah chapter 8. Hopefully you have it. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. There's a lot of names in here. I'm going to skip over the names just for the sake of brevity. But I would like to ask you to do something a little different today. And about halfway through the reading of this, you're going to understand why I'm asking you to do this. But I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of God's word. Would you stand with me, please? Nehemiah chapter 8. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood six people, and on his left were seven other people. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen! Amen! Then they bowed down and worshiped God with their faces to the ground. The Levites, 13 of them in all, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites were all instructing the people, said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food 
and sweet drink and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food, and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. This is God's word. Please be seated. Well, we can see from this passage what Nehemiah's noble ambition has been from the very beginning. This is the vision that he had from the very first time that he was still in Persia and he got the report from his brother that the walls were in piles of rubble, that Jerusalem was in disgrace. This is the picture that he had. Not just finished walls, but a worshiping community. I just imagine Nehemiah on this day. This is the day he's celebrating. It's not the day where they're building the walls. That's not what he's celebrating. This is the day he is celebrating. I, I, I think I'm under obligation because of like the North American Association of Pastors or something, that when your team wins a Super Bowl, you have to use a sports metaphor the next week. So I'm going to do that right now <laughs> under obligation. So just imagine if the Denver Broncos had set a noble ambition this year of winning the AFC championship game. Like that was their noble ambition. What would have happened two weeks ago after they beat the New England Patriots 20 to 18 if that had been their noble ambition? They would have celebrated. Von Miller would have gone on vacation for two or three weeks down to like Fiji. Peyton Manning would have announced his retirement. You know, they would have just all like uh, scattered, right? But they realized, no, no, no. The AFC Championship, that is a means to an end. So th there was a little celebration there, maybe one night, but then they got back to work because their noble ambition was not reached. Their noble ambition was to win the Super Bowl. They had work to do. And in the same way, Nehemiah gets to the building of the wall, and there's a little celebration, but he realizes, you know what, we're not there yet. We got work to do. We need to establish a community of God's people for the glory of God, worshiping God. And just you could tell that this was his noble ambition because look how quickly he gets at this worship experience. Did you notice the timeline? Maybe you didn't notice the timeline, so I'll point it out to you. The, this worship experience, or the, the wall was finished according to um, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. The, the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul. Elul is the sixth month, which would have been October 2. This worship experience, did you notice when it took place? The first day of the seventh month, which is October 8th. So they finished the wall building on a Sunday, the, the very next Sabbath, the very first Sabbath they get to, they're like, all right, we're doing this. No time to celebrate. Gather the people. Call everyone. Get the book of the law. We are going to become a community of faith once again. We are going to worship God. That is our purpose. And let me just tell you, I believe today this is still our purpose. This is the reason that we exist. If you are looking for a great, noble ambition in your life, the greatest noble ambition you can have is to worship God to make God the very center of your life, to give him all of your attention, all of your resources, all of your affection, all of your heart, just everything. Make him the center of your life. If you, I mean, here's the thing. You're going to worship something. I'm going to worship something. God wired us to be worshipers. We worship. And if you don't worship the one who created you, the one who wired you to worship, you will worship something else. And I'll tell you what, it is not nearly as worthy or nearly as fulfilling as worshiping God. If you don't worship God, you will worship sex, or you will worship money, or you will worship sports, or you will worship your job or another person, or you will worship stuff, or you will worship yourself. You will worship something. I will worship something. But none of those things are nearly as meaningful, nearly as worthy as the one who created us, the one who gives us life, the one who sustains us, the one who provides every good gift that we experience. He alone is worthy of our, worship, of our worship, and worshiping him is the only one who could really bring true meaning and satisfaction to our lives. A great Christian author and pastor uh, wrote once, he, he said this about our worship. He says, we have become a nation that worships our work, works at our play, and plays at our worship. We worship our work, we work at our play, and we play at our worship. And this is one of the reasons that Nehemiah chapter 8 is so incredibly relevant for us today, because this is where they were too. They had been 150 years without having a temple, without having a system of worship. They had been dabbling with God. 
They had heard stories about the greatness of God from their ancestors. They'd been passed on from generation to generation. They had heard about the generations of great worshipers, King David, and the worship that they would have under King David. They'd heard those stories, but for too long they had been dabbling with God. And yet here in Nehemiah 8, we see them returning to worship. And it's powerful. And the way they approach and experience God through worship is the same way. There are principles in which we need to approach and reconnect with God as worshipers today. So what do we learn from them and their experience? A couple principles. Let me just point out from this experience we just read. And first of all, we see that worship is a gathering of God's people. Right? So verse 1 talks about all the people assembled as one man. And all throughout the passage, we read about who it's made up of, women and children, those who could understand They all come together as one man. In other words, they are unified under this one purpose. We are here to set our mind and our attention and our affection on God. He is going to get our very best in this gathering and in this moment. They all come together as one man. We're told that this is a central part of of worship. You're like, well, wait a minute. Can't I worship on my own? Does it have to be a gathering? Of course, yes, I can worship on my own. I do worship on my own. I should worship on my own but I'm also called into the gathering. The gathering, the worshiping gathering is a very different experience than worshiping on my own. It is in worshiping in the gathering, the gathering of God's people, that I begin to see God as being big and exalted and omnipotent and powerful and high and lifted up as everyone around me is worshiping and singing. It's a very different experience than when I'm on my own. And this is what the Bible continually calls us to, a gathering, an assembly, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3 says, The seventh day, today, is a Sabbath of rest. A day of what? Sacred assembly. The Sabbath is a day to come together. Why? For the sake of worshiping. Come and worship. As a matter of fact, that verb come is one of the verbs that is most often associated with the command to worship. Come and worship. Come and worship. It's all throughout the Bible. Come, let's worship together. So first and foremost, worship is a corporate gathering as opposed to individual worship. Both are important, but we can't do one at the exclusion of the other. Second, we see that in this experience, the Word of God or the Bible is central to the experience. And this is very important. This is not just an ecstatic experience that they're having, but they come together around God's Word, and it was very different for them then. They had about, you know, this much of it. Right? They didn't have this much yet, but they still had this, and this has as much authority as all of it together. And they come together around this Word because this Word reveals who God is. And worship, really, worship is a response to God revealing Himself to me. And this is one of the best ways that God reveals Himself to me. It's in this book that I learn how good God is, that he is the creator, that he is the sustainer, that every good gift comes from him. It's in this book that I learn that he is merciful and that he is love and that he wants to assemble a group of people into a family, that he wants us to be his sons and daughters, that through this book I realize that Christ came to die for my sin, right? It's through this book that I realize that I have a heaven that's waiting for me, an eternity that's waiting for me. And so the Bible is central to worship. And for these people, again, they would have heard just a part of it, but they would have heard about creation. They would have heard about uh, Joseph and Israel and, and Moses. They would have heard about the, 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 the exodus and being set free from slavery and the parting of the Red Sea. They would have read about the, the covenant, about the law of God, what God required of them. They would have heard all of that as they're standing out. And what's really amazing, it's amazing for us to think that they stood there from, did you catch it? From daybreak until noon. So for six hours, they stood unprotected from the sun. Nothing to sit on. They just stood there listening to the word of God. Let's listen to how, what, what a uh, central part of, of worship the Bible is. This is what happened. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Again, October 8, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Wow, what an experience. The word of God that was just 
the catalytic force that re-sparked this community to become a worshiping community again. And if you look at history, every major revival, every major reawakening within Christianity or the people of God have always had this book as the catalyst that sprung it. You look at one of the greatest revivals of all time, the Reformation. Martin Luther, reading the book of Romans, like, whoa, starts to teach it. It was a catalyst that sparked a revelation, a revolution, a worship revolution. And it's always been that way because the Word of God is so powerful, and it's in the Word of God we learn who God is. And that's why we continue to value the Word of God in our worship today. We value the Bible, and we'll continue to keep it front and center in our worship. And when we do, it leads to the next principle of worship, which is that as we experience God through His Word, it leads to our response that we respond. And in this passage, we read these people responding very, very actively. We see that what this means is that worship really is participatory. Worship is participatory. This is, this is a confusing one for us in our culture. Worship is not something we watch. It is not something we go to. It is not something we observe. Worship is something we do. Worship is a verb. Worship is an activity. It is something that I do. Look at how these people respond to God revealing himself through the Bible and how active and how everyone is engaged and everyone is participating. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. That's why we have a platform today. It's right in the Bible. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Again, this is the reverence they have for the word of God. He's got the book. He opened it up. We better stand. This is, we, we honor this book. This book is holy. This book is, is, is worthy of standing for. This is the kind of, of honor that they have for the word of God. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands. Okay, they're participating. What does this mean? Why are they lifting their hands? We see that body posture is very important in worship. What, 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 do, you, what do you get from this? What does this mean? I surrender. You know, maybe that's what it is. I surrender, or I'm vulnerable, or God picked me up, or whatever it may be. They lifted their hands for whatever reason. And what you find in worship in the Bible is some of the postures we're most comfortable with in our culture, in worship, like sitting, you find no support for in the Bible. You, you, don't, you never find come and sit and worship. That's not in the Bible. But the postures that we're most kind of uncomfortable with in, the, in, in worship, they're all through the Bible. It's really strange. So they raise their hands. And then they respond, amen, amen, which basically means, yes, let it be so. I agree, right? That's what kind of amen means. Then they bow down and worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. Again, just they're all in with all of their body. Their body is saying, we are surrendering to you. We're, we, you have revealed yourself to us. We are responding to your holiness by putting our face to the ground because you are God and we are not. They're all in. This is what's happening. So the word of God is revealed and, and they respond. They participate. And so what this means is that worship is still the same today. Worship, again, isn't something we go to. Worship is not about going and listening to other people worship. Worship is not about going and listening to someone give a sermon. Worship is about experiencing God and responding to God. It is about participating. And, and um, in this experience, we see that there is an audience and there, is, there are performers, there is an audience and there are performers, but those roles are filled very differently than we might imagine. The audience and the performers. Who is the audience? Who, who are the performers? Todd Bolsinger wrote a book called It Takes a Church to Raise a Christian. And he writes of watching an episode of The West Wing in which Yo-Yo Ma, the cellist, goes to the White House to perform for the president. And he kind of elaborates. He goes, that's, that's probably one of the best parts of being the president of the United States is that if you want Yo-Yo Ma to come and play his cello while you eat your dinner, he'll come, right? I mean, that's got to be a great part of being the president of the United States. You can get any performer you want to come to your house and to perform. You know, you want to hear Adele come and do some vocal gymnastics, just have your people contact her people, she'll be there. Or you like the new tune from James Taylor, have your people contact his people. James Taylor will most likely come and perform for you in the White House. You're the president. Your wish is pretty much a command, right? This is what is called a command performance. Now, of course, we live in a free country. James Taylor, Adele, they don't have to come. But if you're invited by the president, why would you not come? What an honor that would be to go and perform in the White House for the president. And Bolsinger points out that this is a, um, a ritual 
if you were, that goes back to the day of, days of the monarchy where kings and queens would command these performances of plays or, or singers or performers to come and perform. And they would come and they would perform primarily for the king and queen to honor them for who they were. If God were to have a command performance, who do you think he would want to come and perform? And the answer is very clear from Scripture. It's us. It is his people. He is asking for a command performance every week to come and gather and perform for me. You are the performer. I am the performer. It's not about a worship team trying to impress people with their talent. It's not about coming and listening to a dynamic sermon and saying, wow, that was good worship. It is about all of us on stage giving a command performance for the audience of one who is God. Now, that makes a lot of us cringe because we're like, I'm not a performer. What does God want me to do? You know, juggle? Stand on my head? Do a tap dance? I mean, what am I supposed to do? But it's really not about performing as much as the idea that I am the giver in worship and God is the receiver. I am the giver, God is the receiver. That means that when I leave worship, it just doesn't even make any sense to say, I didn't get anything out of that. That's not the point. The point is that you give something. And not to me or anybody else. It's, you're coming to give something to God. You're coming to perform to God. God, you've been good to me this week. I am going to sing to you. God, I'm going to give you my offerings. I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you my adoration. I'm going to give you my attention. I'm going to lift my hands to you. I'm going to get on my face before you. Whatever it is you want from me, God, I want to give to you because this is what worship is. And the amazing thing is, is that when we give, we get, right? When you come to give to God, you are not going to leave empty you're going to experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you, and you're going to leave very happy. And you're like, well, you know what? I just don't like singing, or, you know, I'm not a good singer. I get that. That's why the Bible says make a joyful noise <laughs> to the Lord. Make a joyful noise. That's all he wants. What offering are you bringing to God when you come to worship? You just look at how these people participate in worship. Again, they're responding, amen, amen. They're standing up. They're bowing down. Their faces to the ground. They realize they're standing before God. He is in their presence, and they want to respond to him. Finally, I would point out in this experience, as in all experiences in worship, is that it should end with celebration. And we see, we see this very clearly. Um, because worship is an experience with God. It is a, an experience with love, and it is an experience with grace, and it is an experience with forgiveness. Again, look at how uh, Nehemiah puts it in 9 and 10. He says this, then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people have been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. So this is the origin of potluck. Isn't that awesome? It's in the Bible as well, right there. Send some to those who have nothing prepared. Share your food. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. All the people have been weeping. They're standing there. Why are they weeping? Is it because they're unprotected from the sun? Is it because their feet hurt because they've been standing there for six hours? No. They are weeping because they are hearing the word of God. And they realize how far out of alignment they have been with God's will in their lives. They're like, wow, that's how good God is? Wow, that's what God has done for our people? Wow, that's what God expects from us? And they looked around and they're like, we are so far out of alignment. And they just begin to weep. They are convicted of God's holiness and their sin. And their hearts are just breaking at how God, good God had been to them and how unfaithful they had been toward him. And they weep. They're sorry for their sin. And again, I just imagine Nehemiah and Ezra as their leaders looking out at this crowd and there's weeping. And they could see how convicted they are of their sin. And they must have thought, on the one hand, this is really good. This is good. Sometimes it's really good to experience that gap between God's holiness and my sinfulness and to just feel ugh, heartbroken. It's good. But it's not good to stay there, especially when you've been in God's presence. And so they say, you know what? We get it. We understand. But we cannot end this way because God is grace. And God is forgiveness. And God wants to reconcile you. And you clearly have humble hearts. And you're sorry for your sin. And God has forgiven you before you even ask. This is a time of 
joy. We can't leave crying. We're his kids. He loves us. He forgives us. He restores us. Hallelujah, right? So what a powerful worship experience this, this must have been to be a part of, man. It's just six days after the walls are finished, Nehemiah leads out in this worship experience that's a gathering of God's people where the Bible is central. It's participatory. Everybody is participating, and it ends with celebration. And, and I don't know about you, but I read stories like this in the Bible, these worship experiences, and I just, it just makes me hungry. I, mean, I just want to be a part of something like that. I would love to have been there to just observe and participate and just experience the presence of God the way they did. And the beautiful thing is, we can, right? The same Spirit of God is still among us. God is still the same. We could still be that dynamic worshiping community, it wasn't just something that happened 2,500 years ago. It's something that still happens today. Wow. We, too, could be that worshiping community. If you've been with us for a while, you uh, may remember that in 2010, we went through kind of a relaunching of New Day. We had been uh, a multi-site church uh, since 2005, so we were one site of New Day, and our other site was in Franktown, and we got to 2010, and we realized now's probably a good time to make both churches independent, and so we kind of relaunched of sorts in 2010. If you were with us for that, our very first series that we did after that relaunch was called Blasting Off. We spent about four or five weeks looking at what is our identity, what are the things that are most important to us, what is it that defines who we are. And if, again, if you're with us, you remember the very first message after our relaunch, after the, the, the walls were built, so to speak, was called worship. And we said if we're going to be anything, it's got to be a community of worship. This is what we are about. Our noble ambition is to glorify God, to make God known, and to become passionate followers of him who give him the worship that he deserves. And if we want to live a great story, we can't lose sight of this. We can't get lost in, in the means while we're trying to get to that end. So the question is, why do you do what you do? Why do you come to church? Why do you serve? Why do you teach the kids? Why do you work in the tech uh, team? Why do you sing on the worship team? Is it, are you just here for the, the means, or is it the end that we're worshiping for, to glorify God, to make Him known, and to sing His praises now and into eternity? I ask the worship team to come up as we prepare just to respond to God's goodness with a time of worship Matt Redman, maybe you've heard his name before, he is one of the, the greatest worship songwriters and worship leaders of our generation. He, uh, in the 1990s, he was leading a church called Soul Survivor in England. He was the worship leader there. And they were a part of leading out in this great worship revival in England that spilled over into the U.S. We, got, we have so many of the songs that we sing today from that worship revival in England in the 1990s. And at Soul Survivor, they just had everything going for them. They had this great worship band with some of the best musicians on the planet. Matt Redman, one of the greatest worship leaders of our generation, was their worship pastor. You know, they had great sound system, and they're writing great music. And as this is all going on, the church is just exploding. All these teenagers, all these 20-somethings are coming just to experience this worship and this worship revival that was taking place. And that's when the pastor did something just really, really strange and really, really scary. But he announced to the church, he says, you know what, I think we've lost focus. I think we're no longer worshiping God, but we've begun to worship the worship experience. We're no longer worshiping the great I am, but we're worshiping our great worship leaders and our great worship music. And so for an indefinite period of time, he says, you know what, we're going to put aside all of the music we're going to put aside all of the band. Matt's going to take a break. We're going to keep paying him. But we're not, we're not going to have the soundboard anymore. We're just going to come together as a community of faith around the Word of God. And we're just going to rediscover the God behind the worship. And that's what happened. And they said at first it was really awkward and really strange. That they would come together and it would be silent. But they would get into the Word. And as they began to rediscover God, the God behind the worship, Slowly, songs began to come from the congregation, a cappella songs, unaccompanied by instrument, the songs from the heart. And slowly, worship was reestablished in that church soul survivor. And out of that experience, Matt Redman wrote a famous worship song called The Heart of Worship. He says, 
when the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you require. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it. When it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus.